Oh my gosh, I'm live. Hello, everybody. Good morning. If you are on my side of the world, it's currently 8 a.m. and I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. And good evening if you're on the other side of the world. And good day if you're in between that. I have my tea ready to go. I hope you have your drink of choice, coffee, tea, wine, whatever you like. I'm just gonna give it a few more seconds for everyone to get on and start asking some questions. Although I already have some really great questions that I'm excited to get to. And don't worry, this time I'm gonna stick to the timeline. It's only gonna be 30 minutes of great questions. Are you ready? The theme of today is life as a professional beach volleyball athlete. So ask me all those kinds of questions and get ready because we're going live right now. So the first question, why did you choose beach volleyball over indoor volleyball? And that is a really great question. I actually started playing beach volleyball first. Um, and that had a lot to do with my upbringing and kind of how I was introduced to the sport. If you watched last episode, you would know. So if you, if you want to, it was just kind of the natural flow of my entrance to the game of volleyball was to start with beach volleyball. And so I did that and I fell in love instantly because I mean, how could you not? The game is beautiful. It's so inviting. It's so contagious. Um, the energy is incredible. And um, I just love being on the beach. But what I love about the beach game is that as a player, you're involved in every single rally. If you're doing it right, you should be. Um, and it's, it's physically challenging, it's mentally challenging, it's very emotionally challenging. So um, I think it really challenges you as an athlete to be your best and to really understand your strengths and your weaknesses and to kind of play into that, which I really found um, exciting. Whereas indoor volleyball, um, you're kind of put in positions of strength. You know, if you're if you're a good setter, you're going to be a setter. If you're a good passer, you're probably going to be a libero. Um, and if you're tall and, and, and aggressive, you're probably going to be in the middle or right side. So I the indoor game didn't really suit my strengths in the same way. Um, I loved indoor volleyball because of the team aspect and because um, it was just, I think, more of a social um, aspect to the game that I that I missed from the beach. Um, but ultimately, my indoor career was very short lived, and um, the beach is where my heart was at, and that's kind of why I chose it. Um, I think the beach gave me all of the skills that I needed for indoor. Um, it made me a well-rounded player. It made me versatile. Um, I kind of felt like my skills improved more ability and I kind of felt that my future was better suited for the beach game. So that's why I chose beach volleyball over indoor. Sometimes I do miss indoor and I miss like the, the team aspect and, um, my girls, but I love the beach so much, and it's like the only thing that I would want to be in right now. Do I think beach volleyball is easier compared to indoor? That's a loaded question. I feel like I could get some hate if I answer this incorrectly. Um, I think both games are very challenging. Um, I think beach volleyball is obviously very challenging because we're on sand, there's only two of us. Um, we have elements like the sun and the wind and rain and sometimes snow if you're in Russia. Um, but indoor is also very challenging. Uh, it's, a, it's a power game, it's a strength game, it's a speed game as well. Um, so both games are beautiful and both games are equally challenging. Um, what I like about beach though uh, is that you're involved in every single play and there's no coach there helping you. Um, so I think that makes it a little bit harder. I think it allows and forces the athlete to be more independent and to think on the fly. 
um, kind of create their own game plans in the middle of a game. Um, and also, there are no substitutions. So if you're having a bad day, there is no one to save your butt. You just kind of have to figure it out. You and your partner are there. You know, no one's going to take you out of the game. No one is going to give you a refresher. So if you're not feeling it, you got to figure it out. And if you don't figure it out, probably lose, which is okay. And you learn from those mistakes. But um, I think in that way, it can also be a little bit more challenging. Great questions. Oh, so just a little intro. As you can see, my name is Melissa Jimena Perides. I am a professional beach volleyball player for Team Canada. Um, and, you know, the world champion. What inspired me to start this career? I think I I think I did touch that on the last episode, but um, essentially it just kind of happened naturally. I just started playing because I loved the sport at home in, in Canada. I would play for fun on weekends here. And then very quickly I started representing Canada and saw the international game at the international level and fell in love with it and wanted, like from that very first international tournament I had when I was 15 years old, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get better. Because guess what? We finished dead last in that tournament. Um, and so I wanted to get better and I wanted to be able to compete at this level and be able to do this on, on a daily basis for a living is the ultimate dream. And my dream hasn't really changed much from that since I was 15. It's what it's been. Ooh, more questions. Um, okay. All right. Great question. Is it... Is being a pro easier than it looks and do you enjoy it? Being a pro is not easy. And yes, I enjoy it. I have some moments sometimes where I don't, as I imagine most people do with their jobs. Um, but this kind of also leads into another question. What sacrifices did you have to make to get to where you are now? And I think those are both pretty related. Um, it's not easy because it's really grueling and there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes. Um, I, I mean, but in itself, that's still a privilege and I'm still very lucky to be able to do that. Work. I mean, um, it's the best job that I could imagine and it's the hardest. It's not easy because we give up a lot, we sacrifice a lot. I think being a professional athlete and pursuing this dream and this goal is a selfish endeavor because we're working towards our goals and our dreams. And we have a team of people surrounding us that are also helping us get to our goal. And so everything is kind of around us and um, our dreams. And so I think sometimes those dreams can get in the way of other things. You know, you miss a lot of social and family interactions. You miss a lot of birthdays. You miss a lot of weddings. You just miss time with people, which is something that you'll never really get back. And sometimes that realization hits me hard and it's tough to be away from home. It's tough to be away um, from the people that you love and you miss people growing up. Um, I have a niece who's three years old and I have missed a lot of her life because I'm away and you do your best to stay in touch, but that's probably one of the biggest sacrifices is time with people. And our, our time is very regimented and we work usually on four year cycles. So we plan a life every four years based on the Olympic quadrennial. So um, life can go pretty fast when you plan in four year cycles and we're kind of at the mercy of the schedule that's released and that's what our life will look like. And we never know what that looks like until a few months before it starts. So um, I think if you look at it that way, that's probably the biggest sacrifice and the biggest challenge why it's not easy. Um, but on the other on the other side, like there's, there's no other job that I would rather be doing right now. Like the fact that I can play professional beach volleyball as a living um, and I can do it for as long as I can, all good with the body. Um, it, it's a dream. It's a dream come true. But I, it's not as glamorous as it looks. I think Instagram and social media does a good job of making it seem very glamorous. Um, so if you have any other questions about the unglamorous side, hit me up, send me a question, and uh, I'll get to you. But I don't want to ramble too long because I'm going to 
I'm going to keep it short. Once again, we're live here with Melissa Humana Paredes, and I'm answering questions about life as a professional athlete, beach volleyball athlete. Hmm, if I wasn't a professional athlete, what would I be doing right now? Also an excellent question. I probably would do two or three things. So I would probably love to work with animals in some capacity. If I could get paid to play with puppies, I would. I also would probably love to go back to school. I actually really miss school. I like school. Um, and I do want to continue my education after volleyball or maybe even during volleyball. We'll see if that's possible. Um, I would like to go back either study law, environmental law, or continue education in my previous field, which was communications. Maybe that would lead into doing a business degree. Um, but I also kind of have been intrigued by languages and maybe international relations. I can speak Spanish, French, and English. French, like, subpar. Like, I can ask how you can go to the bathroom, but that's about it. Um, and I kind of want to master a lot of international languages before I'm 30. So I have three years to do that. Wish me luck. Oh, and ideally, I would also like to own my own little, like, bed and breakfast or, like, little cafe on the beach or something. I think maybe when I retire, I'll do that. Yeah, that's that's probably what I'll do. Which kind of flows well into another question. Do I want to become a coach like my dad after I finish playing? No, not really. I don't. Um, I have never really gravitated towards coaching the way that my dad has or my brother has. My brother's an excellent coach as well. He's so good at it. And I just never felt like I was that good at it. I also feel like I still have so much to learn that I'm not actually in a position where I can be teaching people, which I know sounds ridiculous because I am like an expert in my sport, but I actually don't feel like it. I feel like I still have so much more that I need to be doing better right now that I'm not in a position to, to teach people, but I know that's just in my own head. I love when I get out there and I'm coaching kids and it's just fun. I think I'm, I'm best at like encouraging kids and being like a really good cheerleader for them. But when it comes to like the technical, tactical side of the game, I actually kind of feel like bad when I'm correcting them, even though it's for their own good. I just want them to have fun. And I just want them to like not feel pressure when they're starting out. And just that's kind of how I started out, just enjoying the game. So at this moment, coaching is not really in my future, but never say never. But I, I'm leaning towards the no part. It just, it, it doesn't quite interest me as much. Um, also, if you're live, give me a thumbs up, post some questions. I'm going to keep answering some questions. We're, we're hitting almost the halfway mark. Just wanted to keep you posted. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, who organizes all the travel and stay? Any tips? Great question. As a beach volleyball athlete in Canada, and I think in, in some other countries as well, but it's all dependent on what your federation has arranged for you, we are responsible for organizing everything. We choose the tournaments we want to play at. We register for those tournaments through our federation. And then after that, it's up to us to figure out how we're going to get there, where we're going to stay, how we're going to get to the next tournament, how we're going to get home, and what we do when we're there. So it's a very independent sport and it's very much up to the players. We have a lot of control, which um, is a plus, I think. Um, and we also have to organize our coaches travel. We have to organize how our coach is going to get there and we pay for that. So um, when we look at flights, we spend, I mean, I'm going to speak for myself, hours I'm still not that good at it. Um, online, trying to figure out the best route, the cheapest route, the route that kind of also won't kill us so that we can arrive somewhat sane and not super tired because uh, we're still trying to get to a tournament to be able to perform. So we try and like juggle price and um, like distance traveled in, in, a, in an appropriate manner. 
Um, and then we also have to look at hotels. And a lot of the times our tournaments are not in like the most populated areas. So there aren't very many options. They can either be really expensive, they can either be really cheap. Um, but we kind of have to plan all of that months in advance, but at the same time, not too far in advance because things change. And there have been many times where I've booked a hotel or a flight and um, the tournament gets canceled. So that's not that fun. Uh, so you just gotta kind of like wait for a good time. Usually the prices are inflated by then, but that's okay because hopefully you'll make it back if you do well at the tournament. Um, but I essentially, uh, it's up to Sarah and I. And Sarah usually, um, she will manage the hotel bookings. So we kind of get one player to do the hotel bookings and then I'll pay her back at the end of the year once it's all sorted out. We each book our flights individually. And then once we get to the tournament, we also have to like book our training schedule. And um, so I'm kind of in charge of booking training schedules with other athletes and stuff at the tournament venue before the tournament starts. And then our coach will book his stuff and then invoice us after. It's all very complicated. There's a lot behind the scenes. I think it, I think there's like a future for being a travel agent um, after I retire. But I guess one of my tips is don't book the first thing you see. Um, kind of look around. Um, there are some really good sites out there. That was not a very good tip, but Anyways, get back to me if you have actual like specific questions that I can maybe help out. Um, ooh, a great question by Joshua. Joshua's coming in with some great questions. Since you traveled overseas most of the times for your tournaments and, and leagues, have you experienced jet lag so bad that you felt it during the game? Yes, yes I have. A couple times actually. But the one that sticks in my head the most is, oh my gosh, there are two. Okay. The first one was on my way from, I don't know where I was coming from, but I was going to Moscow, Russia. And I remember I had a little layover in Warsaw, Poland, one of my least favorite airports. And I think it's because of this experience, but I was delayed, I think about nine or 10 hours, I was sitting in this airport and flight after flight after flight to Moscow just kept getting canceled. And I can't remember if it was for the weather or what, but I was just stuck in this airport. And I was already flying, I think a day later than what I normally fly. So I think it, the tournament was starting on the Wednesday, I believe. And I was arriving, planning to arrive on the Monday ideally morning. Normally we would try and arrive Sunday, but I was like nine to 10 hours delayed. So I didn't arrive until like 1 a.m. Monday. And we had practice scheduled for Tuesday morning. It was the last practice. Normally we get two practices before the tournament. It was the last practice before the tournament started. And I arrived so late Monday morning that I was pretty useless in that practice Tuesday morning. And I didn't have much time to recover. And the next day we were starting to compete and I was so jet lagged. I just was not acclimatized yet. I was still feeling the plane and I didn't have time to get like my plane legs out. It was just an awful start. Somehow we ended up winning our pool. I don't remember the result of the tournament, but I don't think it was good because, um, yeah, we, I don't remember what, oh, it was very bad. It was very bad. <laughs> um, but that was definitely one of the worst travel experiences. Also, second part to this, I remember this so vividly, traveling from the Dominican Republic to China. It was a 40 hour travel experience because it was two days long. And um, I remember the next day we woke up and I was so puffy. I was so out of it. Sometimes you wake up and you have no idea what country you're in. And that was that. It was um, incredible. It was an, inc I, and I actually vlogged it all on my YouTube channel. If you want to go check it out, it was the 40 day or 40 hour travel experience from Dominican Republic to China. It was also Thanksgiving. 
Um, and it was also my birthday weekend. I spent my birthday and Thanksgiving on a plane from Dominican Republic to China eating congee. So um, I've had better holidays, but that was a fun one. Great question, Joshua. You always come through with those questions. Okay. How did I get on the national team? Another excellent question. I started playing in Canada um, provincially and kind of locally. So we would have local tournaments every summer in Toronto um, on the o OVA tournament. So the Ontario Volleyball Association, they would host tournaments and it would be within all of Ontario, kids from across um, the province would come and play in these weekend tournaments. And I would play in different age groups, 12 and under, 14 under, 16 under. And that's kind of how I started getting competitive. Um, and back then, there was nothing that was really structured uh, in terms of a national team or a provincial team, but they were starting to come out with, with these camps and these tryouts and um, these teams that essentially were like, that turned into provincial teams and national teams. Um, but I started representing Canada when I was 15. So only a few years after I started competing in these tournaments. So I started representing Canada. That was my first introduction into international ball and um, wearing the maple leaf. But I wasn't on the national team at that time per se. I was just representing Canada, which I know can be confusing. But um, actually, a few years after that, or maybe even just one year after that, I tried out for the provincial team for my province of Ontario. And did I make it, you guys? No, I didn't. I got cut for my provincial team. Even though at that point I was somewhat successful for my age and I think we won provincials and I think we even won nationals a couple times and I was representing Canada internationally, but I was too short and I got cut. And it was really sad for me. All my other friends made the team, but I was too short and I didn't. So what did I do? I learned how to jump higher. And so I spent a good chunk of the year working out, training really hard, learning how to improve my jump. Because if I wasn't going to grow, at least I could improve my vertical. And I did. And um, 10 years later, <laughs> we won the world championships. And actually, the coach that cut me um, approached me and we had an amazing conversation where she reflected back on that moment and um, realized how it was a flawed system in a way to judge someone on their height um, because clearly it's not an indicator of success. And she was very gracious and kind of admiring and being respectful of the trajectory of my career and how it's not the same for everybody. And um, even though I am kind of on the shorter end, there's still room for us. There's still room for us short girls. And um, I worked really hard. I think it really motivated me to prove them wrong, but also prove it to myself that I could do it and I could be on this level. Um, and a few years later, I tried out for the national team and I got on the team and I've been on the team almost, I think for, more than a decade, maybe about a decade, 10 years or so. And it's been incredible. Um, a couple more questions because we're almost hitting the 30 minute mark and I'm, I'm staying on track. Um, oh, you guys have such great questions. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. There are some great questions here on live. So I'm going to, I'm going to get to those. Greetings from Zimbabwe. Wow, so cool. Does it ever get lonely on tour? All the travel and the long practice days and the hotel stays. If so, how do you cope? Fantastic question. Yes, it does get lonely. Um, not just on tour, but kind of throughout the year. It can get really lonely. Um, how do I cope with it? Well, I think I was kind of forced to get really comfortable with being alone not necessarily being lonely i think there's a difference between being lonely and being alone hold on i just need a sip of my tea it's very cold now um i had to get comfortable with being with myself a lot and like figure out who i am what I to 
and if I'm comfortable doing it on my own. And yes, I am. I had to learn how to do that. It took some time, like, you know, be able to go to a restaurant by yourself, to be able to go to the movie theaters by yourself, to be able to go to a concert by yourself and feel okay and not that people are staring at you and it's a weird thing to do because it's totally not. Love doing it. Um, but sometimes it gets really tough on tour because all you have is volleyball really you know you're there for a specific reason and if things aren't going well um, it can be really tough and really challenging and you're away from family you're missing events lots of travel um when things are going well things are going well and when things aren't it's really tough so and not to mention you're sharing a hotel room with your partner and so you have to be super respectful and mindful of what they're going through as well and the space that they need and so it's just a lot of juggling um of responsibilities and of emotions and um i think it's important to have things outside of sport to help you get through these moments whether um it's a hobby that you like to do if you like to draw or color or um if it's a book you're really into or maybe a show you're binge watching which i'm not gonna laugh because i do that all the time um but it's also really important to create your own support system wherever you go. And I'm really lucky to be able to have that on tour. I have some really close friends that I can always kind of turn to when I need a little pick me up. Um, and I think it's really important to realize that there's a difference between on court and off court relationships. And when you start to build those off court relationships, you create this beautiful little family, which I think we have really, really or done a really good job of on tour. And um, I'm really grateful for those friends because it kind of makes the whole experience a lot more sweeter when you can celebrate with them. And it makes it a lot easier to get through when you have people who are going through the exact same thing to do it with. And um, I think that's really special. Um, so that was a great question. Um, oh, do I recall the toughest game due to weather? Yes, I do. It was a couple, actually. There was one, great question. There was one in Moscow. It was the one that I actually showed up to a little bit late and was super jet lagged, coupled with this interesting weather we had. It started to snow in Moscow in a beach volleyball tournament. Fortunately, the time that it was snowing, we weren't playing. We were watching the games happening because we were scouting, but it was crazy it was actually the first time i remember the australians were also there watching and it was the first time they'd seen snow and so they got so excited and they took their phones out and they were filming all the snow and then it started to hail and i don't know if you know what hail is but it's like little ice pellets that just come down on you um and it was just the most surreal experience because we were playing beach volleyball and when you think of beach volleyball it is the opposite of snow and ice um, so that actually happened. Um, it was a very cold tournament. People were wearing toques and mitts and um, socks, and it just didn't look like a beach volleyball <laughs> game. And I think maybe that's what inspired snow volleyball because that's a thing now. Um, but yeah, that was a really tough game due to weather. And then another really one that sticks out, another really tough one that sticks out in my head. Um, I remember there was somewhere where we were playing in torrential downpour, torrential downpour. Oh, in Poland, we were in the finals against um, Larissa and Talita. And uh, it was pouring rain, like pouring. I've never played in anything. Like I couldn't look up, the rain was in my eyes. The ball was so heavy. It was like so waterlogged, my shoulder was hurting because it was so heavy to hit. Um, and it, you were just soaking wet. And right after that, we had to hop on a flight and our clothes obviously were soaking wet in our suitcase. Um, and, um, we got, we landed in, in Toronto or wherever we were going and the clothes were ruined because they smelled so bad and there's there still stains on it. So we had to throw those clothes out, but that was a really bad one. Another one was actually in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. It was so windy. I'm just gonna go through all of the elements for you. 
because it's such a good question. It was so windy. It was a sideways wind that it, you couldn't even have a game plan because you would just have to serve into the wind, whatever side you were on, because there was no way that you were going to succeed if you didn't. Um, and it just, it didn't even become, it wasn't even volleyball anymore. It was like, who could survive the longest? It was survival ball. And um, that was really challenging as well. Let's see, what element am I missing? Oh, heat. Yeah, the sun. Um, there have been some really crazy, really crazy um, heat tournaments. And one of them, I think, actually was um, in Mexico. Mexico always has, like, the most humid and the hottest tournaments. Japan, I didn't play in this one, but I heard Japan had a really, really, really tough one a few years back in Tokyo. Um, Vienna somehow always comes through with like the hottest tournaments. And when you're on their center court, you're in like an oven. And so it's so much hotter. I remember Vienna has always been like the beach majors, like the biggest events. We had our world championships there. And I remember we're sitting with just like ice on our, heads ice in our sports bras we have like ice vests on from the therapist on the sidelines just trying to like cool our body temperature down because it was just crazy um i think i got all of the elements down great question those are some tough games due to weather okay i got good news there are still a few more questions so i can go for a little bit longer let's see oh okay okay What is the most dramatic game I've ever played? Probably the one at the World Championships against Tanya Nina in the semifinals. Definitely the most dramatic. And I think I did touch on that in my last episode. So if you want more detail, check that out. What is my favorite major series stop? I think I also touched on that in my last episode. But it was Porus Croatia. And I go into detail about why it is. So go check it out. Actually, I just posted a video on my Instagram. So go check that out too. Do you prepare differently for different tournaments? Oh, good question. Yes and no. I think you want to keep your routine and preparation the same in terms of training. No, you kind of prepare and train for each tournament the same. Um, Perhaps as the season gets longer, um, maybe warm-ups get a little bit shorter when you get to the end of the season. But um, you definitely want to keep the same routine heading into most tournaments. I, I think what changes would be game plans and strategies and um, kind of the plays that we want to run. I think and the tactics, those things will change. But in terms of preparation for for um, like literally preparing for a game versus st strength and conditioning, yes, that would change. I think as we go longer into the season, um, we're not lifting as heavy. Um, we're working more on explosiveness and speed and power work. So that changes. Um, but no, I think every tournament is just as important as the last and as the next one coming. So um, I don't think we look at them differently. And each game is just as important as itself. I think there are some tournaments that we will highlight at the beginning of the year and say, this is the tournament that we want to peak at. This is our um, main tournament. This is the goal for the season. And so we will lead up to this tournament to make sure that we're playing and we're peaking at the right time. Um, so that's kind of how we structure our season. But um, I think every tournament and every game is just as important as the last. And so we try and take it um, and hold it in the same kind of importance. Okay. More questions, more questions. Oh, a Spanish question. Hola, May. ¿Quién ha sido tu jugadora favorita de voleibol de playa? Okay. Who has been your favorite beach volleyball player? Such a great question. Okay, I have a couple. First one that comes to my head is Duda. Because fun fact about Duda and I, we have been playing against each other since 
we were like, well, I was like 21 years old and she was like 15 years old. We were playing in the under 23 world championships in Poland. And she, I think she was literally 15, maybe 14 years old. And we were in the semifinals. We were playing against Brazil and Duda was on the other side. And we had been told that this 14 year old player was here. And we're like, oh, let's serve her because she's 14, of course, right? Um, that was a mistake. That was not good planning. We switched it up shortly after because we realized that she is incredible. <laughs> she Even back then, she was so talented, so strong, so skilled. And um, she still is to this day. And I remember that moment so vividly. And I remember just like seeing her grow up and just now she's still so incredible and so skillful. And she's one of the top players in the world. And she's one of the youngest. Um, She's definitely one of my favorite competitors, uh, and I just love her. She's just such a sweetheart. I just love her to death. Um, and definitely Laura uh, Ludwig. She is also an inspiration and just one of my favorite players a lot. I've learned a lot from her and watching her play, and I love competing against her. And she's just also such a light off the court. She's so funny, and she's just a lot of fun. And um, has is very free spirited, and then on the court she is a competitor. Like, don't mess with Laura. Um, so those are probably some of my favorite volleyball players on tour. Okay. Um, another question. Oh, you know what? Well, some of my favorite sports topics. Probably Stad Switzerland in terms of the scenery because it's so beautiful. We're in the we're in the middle of the Swiss Alps and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I just love it there. It's just so peaceful. It's a little piece of heaven. Um, let me see another question. Ooh. Okay. Um, another question. Okay. Ooh, question about analyzing the games and tactics. Someone asked if we had a stats guy and yes, we do. Um, as soon as I partnered with Sarah Pavin, um, I inherited my coach, Scott Davenport, and, um, also Sarah's husband, Adam, who is, very knowledgeable about stats and um, Sarah's brain itself is basically a stats machine. So I came into a team that was like very heavy on analyzing uh, players and uh, tactics and strategy and, and the tactical game. So it was a, a huge learning curve for myself and I learned a lot from them. Um, and so our coach Scott and Adam will kind of put together a pretty detailed game plan and um, everything from like what zones we're serving to like what tendencies to look at to when we want to switch it up, like what plays we want to run. So it became like a chess game and um, it was really interesting. And I really now started to see the game that way. Um, I still also kind of revert back to moments where I just like, I'm a, I would consider myself like a flow player, kind of like a feel player. I'll just follow my instincts and, um, my volleyball IQ. And so if I see something that might not be on the game plan, I'll go with it. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. Um, but that is something that we definitely, I think is more prevalent in the indoor game, but now it's definitely making a transition into the beach game. Um, and it's been really fun. Um, my mixed partner in a two on two world tour event. Okay. <laughs> Probably. Oh, what a good question. I remember I answered this question a few years ago and I think I said Phil Dalhauser, but I feel like it's changed since then. Maybe Anders Moll is just a phenomenal blocker. Um, so he, he would be a great mixed partner. However, I also really like the, the style of game that um, like the Polish guys like Kenter Loziak play where it's like super speedy and lots of plays and also um Samoylev Smedens from Latvia oh they're like they're like 
sets and then their hits over and you know have you ever seen them play you know exactly what i'm talking about like that's so cool i would love to be able to do that so to answer your question i don't know one of those guys probably anders Lowell, maybe if he would want to play with me that could be fun okay okay we're going on to 40 minutes couple more questions right do you think i have time you guys <laughs> okay what do you think is the most important key as a setter i find setting to be a really beautiful skill one of my favorite skills is also the most intimidating skills because there's a lot of room for error and so i also think it gets the there's a misconception about setting that it's like very much a overhead move which um yes a lot of it is driven from your arms and your wrists and whatnot but it's forgotten that it starts from the legs and i think the reason why people um don't like hand setting because it's a lot of work it's a lot of work to get your feet there and if you don't get your feet there you're not going to be in the right position and that will increase your risk of error or of a double and a lift and so um it can be really tiring after hand setting all game long all tournament long um because it's 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 so the fundamental part of setting comes from the legs. Like you have to drive it from your legs and then the arms should just be there to like support it. Like it's kind of like, it's just like a trampoline where like, I don't even know if that's the right example, but it's supposed to just like help spring the ball and it's like the direction comes from your wrists and your hands, but the momentum comes from your legs. And I feel like people forget about that because it's so um, important. So I hope that helps, but Oh, great question, Carrie Morgan. Do you think height and hand size matters for being a beach volleyball player? I have tiny hands, and um, I, you know, am a pretty good setter. So, no, um, I don't think hand size matters. But maybe in the guys' game, um, height it doesn't matter. No, and people will tell you that it does, but. It doesn't. I think the game is definitely growing. Um, there are a lot of people who are over six three, and um, it can be intimidating when you're five nine like myself. But I think some of like the fiercest competitors on tour and some of the most exciting people to watch are like the smaller players. And I think there will always be room for us. And um, Brazilians have never been extremely tall and they rule the beach as well. So it's just, you just kind of have to cater into what style of play fits your strengths the best. And, um, their style of play is phenomenal. And, um, I think it can be really easy when you get to run over at your, and, um, there's no room for you, but that is absolutely not true. There are so many things you can do. There's so many things that we're better at. Um, but being a little bit smaller, I think um, we are maybe are quicker, are faster, um, and I think don't ever listen to someone who, so, sorry, don't ever listen to someone who tells you that you're um, too short or have too small hands. Um, I think you'll be fine. Okay. Um, Last question, maybe, oh, oh yeah, okay. Volleyball, what volleyball tip or insight have you received that has helped your game so much? That is a great question. Oh, okay. When I think about like the, for the skills, for like passing, for instance, my coach, um, <laughs> has like really tried to drill in my head. I used to be, and sometimes still revert back to being handcuffed a lot where I, my hands come together early and I'm running like this, which is the most inefficient way to chase a ball or pass a ball. So um, this definitely is stuck in my head. Uh, just don't get handcuffed when you're passing. You wanna keep your arms apart for as long as you can and bring them together as soon as you see the ball. Like you kind of want it to like, kind of happen as the ball is coming. 
um, rather than bring your arms together early and then try and adjust from there. It just, it doesn't work. It's not that efficient. There's a lot more room for error. And so that's something that has stuck with me for a while on defense as well. When I would do some drills um, and they were drills to kind of just get me to touch the ball. I was told be a sprinter until you reach the ball and then become a volleyball player. And I think that's really helped me a lot because there were times where I don't think I would be able to get to a ball. And it's very incredible when you set your mind to it, how many balls you can start to touch once um, you, you set your mind to it. And so I try and stick to that as well. Like when I'm on defense and there's a shot that I don't think I can get seems so far away. I think about becoming a sprinter in those few seconds. And then as soon as I get to the ball, I become a volleyball player again. So I think that's kind of helped me. Um, and honestly, I think the best tip as well is that you cannot control what the other team is doing. You cannot control the refs. You cannot control the weather. All you can control is what you bring to the court. And um, sometimes in moments of despair or struggle, it's easy to forget about that. Uh, and you start thinking about everything that could go wrong when all you really need to think about is getting the ball over the net on the other side, away from your opponent and let it hit the sand. Like that's, that's really the goal. And so when you kind of simplify it that way and not think about um, everything that could go wrong, everything that's out of your control, I think you'll enjoy the game a lot better. And I think that was one of the best things that uh, has ever been told to me. Oh, wow. Okay, Tim VB15, we're going to finish on this question because it's a party question and the party's almost done. Which city has the best players party? Oh, which had the best players party last season? And who is the best dancer? <laughs> okay. Which city had the best player party last season? I can't even remember last season. Okay. Well, Vienna always comes through with a good party. Um, I feel like, honestly, one of the, one of the best parties I've, that stuck in my head um, was years and years and years ago. It was in uh, Puerto Vallarta. There was, it was like the, in October, it was one of the last tournaments of the season and people just kind of went to go play because it was like also a vacation spot and they wanted to spend their vacation there. And they threw an insane after party for the players. It also happened to be my birthday. So I think that's why it was so special for me. Um, but we were, all the players were at the, in this bar and there was a pool in the middle of the bar, which I think in most countries would be illegal or just, not um it's very safe but there was a pool in the middle of the bar and um you know after the party gets going people start jumping in the pool and i remember we were all just in dresses and nice clothes and we were all just jumping in the pool um we're playing chicken like having chicken wars where you're on people's shoulders and you're trying to knock them off i don't know if i should be telling these stories anyways um best player party honestly the major series always outdo themselves. Um, I'd say, I remember we went to, okay, we went to Hamburg one year. It was for the World Tour Final. So there were only, it was only the top eight teams in the world. And so it's, it was a smaller group of athletes and they set up this um, tour of the red light district in Hamburg. And it was, it was led by one of the most famous drag queens in Hamburg and um, they took us, they told us the history of how drag came to be and the history of like the red light district, which was so fascinating. Um, I ended up losing my wallet sometime on that trip, found it later that night because someone found it and recognized my name, I guess, and gave it to the police. And I thought it was just so sweet. Anyways, um, we ended up after that tour, we ended up going to a nice little party and um, Laura, you know, she was dancing up a storm on the bar um no i'm kidding i really don't think i should be telling these stories um but i would say laura has really good dance moves and she is not afraid to show them brazilians always have good dance moves because they just know how to flow and how to move their hips and they have rhythm um so they're also very good at dancing they're always a good time yep 
That's where we're gonna end. You know who's not the best answer? Such fun, you guys. I think we should end it here. We're almost at the hour mark and I said I would keep it to less than the hour. So I'm gonna try and stick to my promise. Um, these were some great questions. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I think I'm gonna be coming back for another episode next week. So get your questions ready. We don't know what the theme's gonna be yet, but stay tuned. I hope you got through your tea or your glass of wine, wherever you are. And um, have a great night, wherever you are. Have a great day if you're with me on this side of the world. I had a great time with you. My name is Melissa Humana Paredes. I play beach volleyball 14 Canada. And um, this is so much fun. Thanks for joining Mondays with Melissa. Bye, everybody.